Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the second Sunday of Easter, which falls on April 24, 2022, are from Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. The psalm is 150. The second reading is the first of six Sundays in a row on the book of Revelation, chapter 1, 4 through 8. And our gospel reading is John 20, 19 through 31, always and forever, the second Sunday of Easter, and air quotes, doubting Thomas, who is not doubting, but we'll get to that. So, well, and also it's uh, it's John's account of the giving of the Holy Spirit. So it's the, it the, the so-called <laughs> Johannine Pentecost. The so-called Johannine <laughs> Pentecost, which is the gospel text for year A, we should note. So John 20, 19 through 23 is the gospel text for Pentecost in year A, not year B or C, but year A. So yes, it is the uh, giving of the spirit and then, of course, the appearance to Thomas. So... I'll jump in and say somewhere in my youth or childhood, you can cue up the movie. Okay, not that movie. Actually, I'm thinking Casper. Um, actually, I'm not even thinking a movie. I'm thinking the cartoon, Casper the Friendly Ghost. Um, somewhere when I was a kid, somebody really reached into this and, and paid attention to the shock and awe of, of the experience and, and this idea of, of a, 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 a ghost, you know, and how do you respond to seeing something that you don't expect and then hearing people talk about it and you weren't there. And, and that's the movement that uh, it is happening in, in, in throughout this, this particular scene. Um, so um, I, I don't, call this the doubt of Thomas. I simply call this the, I really would love to have that experience. And, and so I, I just wanna say, as you prepare your messages for, for this week, and actually for every summer, ser sermon, to remember that some child is eavesdropping as you preach, and you are putting the image of the story of God showing up and showing out in their imagination. And is this a God that they want to say, what happened to you? I, I want to happen to me. Um, the first time Thomas wasn't with them, the next time they gather, Thomas is there. So in the midst of this, Thomas wanted the experience that they had. And are you presenting uh, this uh, intrusion of Jesus in such a way that people says, if there's a place where Jesus is going to show up, I want to be there. I want to see for myself. Well, that's a major, uh, that's a, an important theme here too, Joy, right? Is and, and the corrective, if you will, to doubting Thomas, because the word is not doubt. It's uh, do not be unbelieving, but believing. Uh, and so, but what he wants is, or what he needs is what everybody else had. Uh, you know, the Mary Magdalene said, I have seen the Lord. Uh, the disciples say, we have seen the Lord. And so it's Thomas's turn. And I, uh, I wrote a sermon about Thomas uh, several years ago, and I called it uh, the courage to ask. And and that Thomas asks for what he needs and what he what what he needs for uh, for this, you know, for this to sink in for him. And he also this is not the first time that he asks for something like back in chapter 14, when Jesus says, you know, I'm I'm basically leaving. And but in and, you, you know, you know, the way and Thomas is like. No, we don't. We don't know the way. What is the way? Tell us the way. And then Jesus says, I am the way. Uh, and so Thomas, as a character, is um, asking for uh, and asking for what he needs. And uh, the commentary, uh, the the focus on trust here is, I, I think, the the undercurrent, the undercurrent here in that uh, that's what relationship is about. It is about trust. 
uh, that 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 asking in a in a relationship brings about an answer and that you and you you have the courage or you do ask because you know that relationship is there and so he asks for what he needs and and what he needs is that that same affirmation that the relationship with Jesus uh is is not he has not been left orphaned or abandoned that that who that what Jesus promised in the farewell discourse indeed is coming true here uh, in in Jesus presence. Um, I will not leave you orphaned. I will not leave you abandoned. Uh, th that's connected to the spirit too. but it's a it's a lovely um, it's an it, you know it's an entrance into the, the level of trust of this disciple. Uh, who is not about doubting? He doesn't need proof uh, at all. He uh, he 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 just he needs that same affirmation of that relationship. For every sermon that's ever been preached that says, um, you know, we're the we're we're the doubting Thomas. You know, we're the ones who didn't believe. You know, who weren't there. That's what I'm trying to recapture. We're the ones who weren't there. And yet um, we're offered that same trust. We're offered that same experience. Um, Matt, you are ready. Oh, just that was, it's all great. This is all good stuff, especially to, to, push, to push aside for a lot of people, this image of, of Thomas as the skeptic or something like that, or Thomas is the one who, you know, requires some kind of an experiment, you know, he's the scientist or something like that, you know, but this is, it, it, there's an intim intimacy to this story that that we need to look at. I taught on this about two years ago and did a lot with artwork and was fascinated by the various ways artists either depict Thomas as kind of standing off and looking, at the, you know, examining the wounds or somewhere he's very up close and personal. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, <laughs> um, I wouldn't go into this in a sermon, but it, it's probably wet and it's probably smelly. It's probably, you know what I mean? Wounds are gross. And the it, and, and the, the passage doesn't dwell on that, doesn't even say that Thomas actually finally puts his hands inside of Jesus' body. Yeah, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But Jesus does offer his body in this. I think that's something we can say. Jesus does say, here, here it is <laughs> in all of its crucified glory. And you're welcome to um to have my body. I mean, there's a, there's something about that that's that's a little, uh, we don't quite know what to do with. And some artists have done some interesting things with it, but it's, I, where I would, what I'm talking about this is because a sermon needs to, I think, point out that it's not just Thomas getting quote unquote proof or what he needs, but there's a deep intimacy here of a Jesus who literally opens himself up for others. And, um, I don't quite know what that means. I, my own my own sacramentology gets really nervous right here, but it makes me think of 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 chapter six, of course, where Jesus talks about eating his body in 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 pretty gross detail. And it's part it's part of John's uh, it's it's part of John's idiom, right? It's John's theological way of speaking. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to lose that. I don't want to turn Jesus into some object who gets poked and prodded. He's a subject who um I don't know the right word to use except opens himself up, but that's a little bit too. That's not quite. Well, well, I think I, I think the other connection you would want to make if you went that direction, and I, you're absolutely right, Matt. That 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 you know, offering of his body. You know, I am I am the bread of life. It's like a re, it's like it's a re embodiment of that promise uh, in chapter six. But it's also it's also encapsulates what does it mean that the word became flesh? Uh, you this is you know this is this is John 1 14 uh, all over again. And and so it invites um, imagination around what does the incarnation truly mean? Uh, and what did it what, what what does it mean for how we believe uh, who Jesus is and who God is and and the fact that God God's self became a body. Uh, so it invites homiletically, I think a lot of it. Yes, it's you know, we're still in the season of Easter, but we're in it where it invites also commentary on the incarnation and and what that and and what that means for our faith uh, and. Uh, and that it, you know, and it leads actually to Thomas 
Thomas's confession that holds that reality together, my Lord, right, Jesus, and my God. And so that the word became flesh, you know, the flesh, that's what this gospel is holding together. And that theologically is really important and really offers is also another corrective to Thomas who needs proof. You cannot prove <laughs> fully God and fully man, you know, fully human. That's not, it's not about understanding. It's not about proof. It's not, it's about presence. Uh, and the fullness of that presence. And we're, you know, we're, we're coming full circle, not quite yet, because we still have the ascension, the promise of the ascension, but the incarnation and the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension in John are not chronological things. They are, they are all, they're all integrated and uh, you can't separate one out from the other. Uh, and so this is, yeah, this is a really, this is a restatement of the promise of the incarnation. And I'm going to um, go back to what I said last week in terms of not telling folks what to believe. Jesus didn't tell Thomas what his response was to be. And Thomas's response was to say, my Lord and my God. He didn't say, Call me Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it, it again. There, there isn't a, pres a prescription, but there is such an encounter. Um, I'm going to use your word, uh, Matt, but Caroline, you talked about it uh, last week. There's that intimacy. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what he needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We could talk about the spirit, but we're going to get the John, you know, John's pneumatology coming up for Pentecost. So we could come back to it or we could talk about it here, but, um, or we can move on. <laughs> what do y'all want to do? You want to go to Max? <laughs> I, I, well, I, I'm sure we will talk about Ax at some point. Yeah. I think the, the only thing I would say, uh, because we, I, I will talk, don't worry, um, in, in great length about John's pneumatology uh, in, on Pentecost, where we get a section from the farewell discourse. But uh, I, the, the one thing I would say here, uh, too, is we were talking about, um, we were talking about the, you know, closed spaces. We mentioned that last week about the tomb. And here the disciples uh, are the doors of the, it, it's the doors were locked where they were. The, the word house doesn't appear in the Greek text. Uh, and it's, it, it's just, you know, it's the doors locked where, the doors locked wherever they are, which I think homiletically invites a lot of possibility of where, what are our, what are what are we locked behind? What kind of fear? And it's into that, uh, it's into that fear uh, it, that that Jesus comes. And this is this is uh, this has been promised throughout, or this has been a reality throughout Jesus' ministry. Jesus, the the calling of the disciples is really about finding the disciples, not a call, but a finding. That's the primary language. Uh, Jesus finds the woman at the well going into Sikhar. Jesus finds the man uh, born blind who was cast out and the word is found. The word found isn't here, but we know that this is what Jesus does. Jesus finds his disciples no matter where they are. There's something beautiful about that too here in this passage uh, that Jesus seeks out and finds uh, finds his disciples, and that the first word he says to them into that that place is peace. And uh, the last time he's talked about peace was the farewell discourse. And so how that the entirety of the promises of the farewell discourse, uh, the the it, it just how I just think like the disciples are sitting there and just how all of those words and a lot of words like you know. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, five chapters of words uh, just come flooding back into that moment uh, with Jesus' presence there. Peace be with you. And then just, whew, yeah, that would be really something. So what would wow. it feel like? What would it feel like for Jesus to enter into your locked space and say peace? And uh, This is a scene of good, a scene of awe. 
a, a scene of making a way out of no way. And right now that's what we need most uh, uh, to have bursting into the spaces, the pandemics, I say plural, the pandemics have locked us in. Um, and what we believe sets our life or our death, uh, the kind of death that is born of doubt and the kind of life that is born when we have the intimacy of encountering the risen one. But now we really should move on because because <laughs> we've been talking. Yeah. So uh, Acts, Acts 5, 27 to 32. You're both looking at me. I can tell even yes, through Zoom. I, I, I just... We're, uh, my, yes, my eyes are like piercing into your yeah. into the screen. Well, let me just say this. This is not a criticism of the lectionary, but the lectionary is not really interested in introducing people to the book of Acts as a narrative or on the whole. Really? The lectionary is much more interested in mining out of the book of Acts examples of resurrection preaching, resurrection claims, or narratives of, of new life breaking forth. Which is fair. It's 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 saying you know what does Acts look like in this season? Um, so if you want to study Acts with your congregation, I I know of a couple of books, but I do uh, cool. uh, I think the, the guy's name is Matthew L. Skinner. Probably. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. I, um, th that's kind of a joke, but it's but it's it's to point out that what we've got here in five twenty seven through thirty two is again a speech really ripped out of context that would become much richer if you added the context, but I'm not going to say add verses because it's not for this time of year for what it's trying to do in the Easter season. It raises themes that again, a, a preacher can can pick up and run with if you want to. And, and this goes beyond the, we must obey God rather than any human authority and questions of, of religious descent. And you know, there's a lot of history behind that, but it's this really, really short statement, almost too short to be called a sermon, uh, the, you know, the God of our ancestors, the connection here to Israel, the, the raising up of Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree, this idea of who's, who's culpable. And here it's the leadership in Jerusalem. Back in chapter two and three, it's really all of Jerusalem. So that's a moving target that we want to pay attention to. And, and how is this not so much laying the blame on just a couple of individuals, but something bigger? Anyway, more importantly, right, God exalted him. So now you've got talk of ascension. You've got talk of where is Jesus now? And what does it mean to think about Jesus as leader and savior who gives things? We've got mention of forgiveness. Uh, and we've got mention of being witnesses of these things. So it starts to push the question of, okay, Easter Sunday was great, but now what? And how come life is just as difficult now as it was before Easter and, and pushing that? But, you know, so what are these, where do these grandiose claims of new life take us? And here's certainly not a comprehensive answer, but that's really none of Acts wants to give a comprehensive answer. But Acts does want to insist that it's through Jesus that God is remaking the world. It's through Jesus that the powers of the world, the authorities of the heavens, are, are are on the run now, or at least are um, are shown to be not what you thought they were. So it opens the door, right? It's not it's not a sermon. I think you want to kind of go through verse by verse or point by point and explain as much as you want to pick up on some of these themes and and run with them with the congregation to get at the question that I always want to ask on Easter Sunday, which is, so what or or now what? Like what what are the implications of this? for my life, for my neighbor's well-being. Sorry, that was kind of a rehearsed speech, but uh, no. what do you think? <laughs> that, that's great. Yeah. I yeah. really appreciate the fullness of the context uh, that you give us, particularly not to just pull it, not just to continue to pull it out of context. Um, I think that's the big thing for us is we're in the midst of an incredible ongoing story. Um, and let's tell it in such a way that folks have this experience of being witnesses to what God is doing and God has been doing. So thanks for that, Matt. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. You two don't want to talk about Acts. You want to talk about Revelation or? Actually, I'm going to say something about Psalms uh, because it's a favorite <laughs> Psalm and a familiar Psalm. Um, and even if you don't preach on it, which, you know, it's post-resurrection, um, the time when the church is 
is, uh, has the opportunity to rehearse the incredible rumors of the resurrection and the life those rumors have brought to every culture and, and community and context. I don't know for the last 2000 years, but what I wanna say is that talk about whichever text you're going to linger in this sum Sunday in such a way that it truly gives us something to praise God for. And so if you use this psalm liturgically, let the rest of the, the service bring us to where we are truly praising God. That's what I would say, use it liturgically. It should be sung. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah it, should, it should not be explained. It should not no. be explained. And, it, and uh, yeah, just it's the, it's the perfect psalm for the second Sunday of Easter of praising praising God uh, for what, what God, uh, what God has done. And so, yeah. I like it because I think I can understand it without knowing a word of Hebrew or a word of like historical context. I think it actually makes sense. It, it, it does. You don't need, without, you don't need three Bible scholars to tell you. We don't need Rolf <laughs> to, uh, to we say, do need Rolf, but, we do, but for this psalm, we don't. Yeah. For this psalm, we can actually like figure it out. Yeah. Uh, okay, Revelation. So as I said in uh, introducing the text for the podcast today, uh, we have six weeks on Revelation. And uh, I think a wonderful opportunity if that's what, where you choose to go uh, to, uh, to take on a, a still very maligned and misinterpreted uh, book in scripture as uh, the commentary points to. Uh, and so that might be definitely a choice that uh, direction and and the the way in which revelation uh two is so misunderstood and i'm i'm really wondering as well how it is a book that you know at its heart really does speak to a uh, speak a truth about if you question the power and the authority and the presence of God, now here is a book that helps you uh, name name that no God is you know God is here and God is present, which is the nature of apocalyptic. I would add uh, verses. I would just start with verse one and go to verse eight, and then uh, the other thing I would do if you are setting this up, uh, I think it's important to. Uh, do a, a pretty, it doesn't have to be extensive, but a pretty brief uh, uh, summary of the churches. And because these churches experience what we experience, uh, these churches are, you know, they're, they're in the midst of having pressures from outside of outside of their community. Well, so do we. Uh, the Laodicea is a lukewarm church, you know, neither hot nor cold. How are we lukewarm? I mean, these are these are real churches in real situations, and uh, and I think that makes that makes Revelation a little bit more uh, grounded in in uh, words that we need to hear as well. To understand that, uh, in in to put it back in its context, which is which is what you're asking us to do, Caroline, but also to understand that in terms of what the metaphors would have meant for them, you know. So, for example, the lukewarmness means something to us because of all of the sermons that have been have used that, and it doesn't pay attention to the clarity that that metaphor would have been understood in, in, in its historical context. And I wonder if, um, if uh, folks are going to take these next few weeks to actually delve into Revelation, if they would actually do that, if they would actually read through commentaries, understand uh, as, as the commentary this week says, this isn't written to us, um, uh, as is often said when you say that, it is still yet written for us, as you've alluded to, uh, Caroline, our circumstance now is very much like theirs. Um, and so we need to read it so that we can see the parallels of a community's experience then, so that we can recognize what it is saying to us now. And um, not to do that with just the the one on with the one liners that we would pull out, but to go back to read it to understand it, um, Matt. As you were talking about putting the Acts text back in its narrative context, 
to put revelations into its narrative context with all of the imagery that is before us and not just the misinterpretations that uh, years of, um, of, of, of poor teaching has given us. This is a great opportunity and I'll stop after this and say, this is a great opportunity because the moment that we're living in needs this kind of apocalyptic literature. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, if you want to study this more with your congregation, uh, I, I know a great book. <laughs> I'm recommending these. Uh, my yeah. friend Greg Carey has just published a, a kind of a study guide, kind of a church, uh, small group book on Revelation. And Greg's a great teacher. Uh, a couple of interesting things about this text for me right now. I mean, it, it mentions death, the faithful witness that's referring to Jesus' death. Mentions resurrection, he's firstborn of the dead. Mentions ascension, he's now rulers of the kings of the earth. But what I want people to note is that at least the last two, resurrection and ascension, as soon as you talk about that, you've you've entered into an apocalyptic landscape, right? So as soon as on Easter Sunday, somebody (laughs) utters the word resurrection, or the empty tomb means he's raised from the dead, this is what rings all of the bells in a first century Jewish audience's mind at a time when, when the, the, the prospect of re- resurrection from the dead was a relatively new theological idea, an idea that emerges in Judaism alongside the rise of apocalyptic literature, right? Take away the last page of the book of Daniel, and there's no reference, I would argue, to resurrection from the dead as it became understood in the Old Testament. Now, there are images of a God who overcomes death, and there's other kinds of resurrection-ish symbolism, but this is a relatively new thing in Judaism, and it's, so as soon as the New Testament wants to talk about life after death by God, we're in apocalypse. So what does that mean then to talk about Easter as an apocalyptic, in a decisively apocalyptic moment? I think in part, it means you have to take a book like Revelation seriously in terms of literary genre, but it means also you've got to now talk about a God who is not content to let the powers of this world stand, whether those are powers of death or the things that, 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 that hasten death along in terms of destructive ideologies, spiritual forces, or whatever. And I think I'm really on a kick of like the, the combative, um, message of Easter last week and this week. But that's part of it. You've you've got to talk about a God who's got some battles to fight and some battles to win. And that's one of them on Easter. And the only other thing I would say too here is uh, as the promise both in verse four and in verse eight, uh, that if you know if you hear nothing else from the, the book of Revelation, it's the promise of of I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come. So that this is this is yes a, a promise for our future, but the promise is fundamentally uh, the presence of God here and now, fighting those battles, as you said, to 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 win. Um, uh, to to win that cosmic battle, but to also win life for us. <laughs>